There's a, there's a kind of knowledge or a kind of awareness that children have. It's been described as uh, a sort of porous relationship to reality, kind of porous uh, awareness of spiritual things, of God, of, uh, of all that perhaps is even difficult to express. And children are very immediately aware of this. And what can happen as we get older is that we, we're, we become more and more sort of buffered from this bigger reality and we start to treat uh, the world like a world of objects and we, we intellectualize everything and, uh, and, and we sort of lose this, this deep spiritual awareness. And it's a great tragedy. It's why, by the way, Jesus says that you cannot, you, in, in order to enter the kingdom of God, you, you have to become like a child. And my, some of you will remember uh, me interviewing my mother. Does anyone remember, uh, it was about a year or so ago, I interviewed my mum, and mum tells the story about when she was six years old. And she, she had this really powerful awareness of God with her and loving her and even this sense of calling on her life as a six. She says she remembers it really, really it's so powerful. She remembers it uh, to this day and, and, and mum's, uh, well, let's not, we don't have to talk about that, but she's older than that now. And, but she still remembers this very strong awareness and this strong sense of calling on her life. And the interesting thing about this is that she wasn't in a context where that was at all validated. In fact, um, my, my grandfather, who did change uh, very much towards the end of his life, but was fiercely, fiercely against anything to do with Christianity or spirituality. He was an avowed uh, atheist. He was a formidably well-educated uh, man and um, but very, very much against uh, anything to do with spirituality or Christianity or anything like that. So yet in that context, she just had this immediate awareness of God and God's love and this calling on her life. And of course, uh, as she grew up, it was sort of educated out of her, I'm sad, uh, sad to say. But she rediscovered that later in life. And do you know how she rediscovered it? Because God put Christians, ordinary people like you and me, in her life. And it was their very presence and their willingness to actually do what people in our culture don't really do, hardly ever, because we live in a fairly shallow culture. People who were willing to scratch below the surface and have deeper conversations about deeper and more ultimate things. It's very rare in our, in our study. It's very, when we open up conversations about those things, you're doing something very countercultural. I mean, the hunger there is in people. People are asking those sorts of questions. But how often do you, you know, go to a party and people are talking about that kind of thing ordinarily? Well, n almost never in my experience. But mum came across people who were willing to talk about those sorts of things. And the effect that it had is that it reawakened this experience again, this sense of a God who loves her. And she realized that she had, she realized that she'd walked away from that and that God was calling her back. He was calling his little girl back home again. And to me, it speaks of the importance of our presence wherever we are. Because there's something about our presence um, in, in the New Testament, in, in the Bible, it, has this, it, it says that we are the aroma of Christ in the world. I wonder if you've ever had the experience where you've, you've smelt something, just very faintly you've, you've smelt something and it brings back a memory that, Maybe something that you'd for, and, and maybe you're not even quite sure what it reminds you of, but it really takes hold of you. Can you can you think of examples where that happened, where that's happened? You know, and it's just you you sense this faint sort of aroma, and it's like, 
oh man, this is bringing back something. It's really grabbed me and it's bringing back something. I can't even really articulate what it is. You know, that's what the presence, that's what our presence, if we're willing to let a little bit out of that, and this is one of the problems, is that often we close down because, you know, we don't want people to not like us, right? Because it's a bit countercultural, isn't it? And so we tend to close that down. But if we have a little bit of boldness and we let a little bit of that out, there's something intangible that happens, that people catch this. It, it, it awakens something in them that, that is lying dormant, a longing, something that perhaps they've known that gets reawakened. And, and today, I, I wanna speak to this very directly with reference to some really interesting sections and, and a, a strand in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, and if you're visiting us uh, today, we've been reading together as a church, reading through uh, the Gospel of, of Matthew in the New Testament, which tells the story of Jesus. It's a wonderful account of the life and teaching of Jesus. And I'd like to, I'd like to just pull some sections out of this that speak not only to what I've just spoken about, but also to our, our role in what God wants to do in people's lives. So I'm going to look at Matthew chapter 4 uh, from verse 18. And there's always a lot to say about these things. And I just want to remind you, too, for those of you who are reading uh, and tracking through, it's actually the Gospels of Matthew and Mark that they're reading, that we're reading together. Uh, I I do a, a, a podcast, which is really an in-depth Bible study that gets, goes much more deeply into these sections. It's called Thrive Deeper. And uh, some of you will be using the Thrive booklet to uh, guide you through um, your, your Bible reading. But there's also a podcast. You can look up Thrive Deeper and you'll find that there. So I do commend that to you because, uh, again, great way of uh, just getting more deeply into God's Word, which I recommend. <laughs> um, so uh, chapter four, and I'm going to discipline myself to not get too lost in the details here and get sidetracked because there's just one thing that I want to draw out of this. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. I think in our context, that can sound a little negative, like we've got to go, you know, I don't know what, go out and like catch people or something. <laughs> that sort of sounds a bit negative. This is actually meant as a kind of rescue operation, like God is a father who loves his children. He's drawing people back to himself, right? So there's a, there's a sense of rescue operation to this. You know, on, um, if, if, we, if we're going to think of, you know, casting a net, it's probably a little bit... Um, more like, like there's a particular kind of net, oh, what are they called? Um, completely gone out of my head. Uh, these nets that, that large ships throw over the side. If there's someone in the ocean, they, or someone that needs to board the ship, they throw these big nets over the side so people can grab onto them. It makes the ship accessible. Uh, oh man, so, so, someone, Someone look up on their phone, talk to your AI and look it up. Uh, what are those nets that you cast over? It's really annoying me that I can't remember it because I, uh, I know this well. I've just completely gone. Any, hey? No, and it's not a cog. Scaling nets. Uh, trawling net. No, no. So this is like a, yeah. <laughs> okay. This is... <laughs> Anyway, you don't get distracted by it and I won't get distracted by it. But do you know what I mean, right? You've probably seen those before. Because um, ships, large ships are actually, you can't really get on board from the ocean, right? And, and you have to put these nets over the side. To, and I'm going to emphasize this, to make the ship accessible. Because one of the things that I'm going to say today, folks, is that we need to make this ship accessible, because we're not just a cruise ship, we're also a rescue operation. Made up of a whole bunch of people, ourselves who have been rescued from living life without God, living as orphans spiritually, 
God so loved the world that he mounted a rescue operation, beginning with Jesus, exactly what I just read. And he wants us to let down whatever that net's called. Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder? Like, where do you get this stuff from? <laughs> Did you try chat GPT? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, let's, let's just, let's move right along here. This is getting ridiculous. I'm going to keep reading the Bible, okay? So let's just leave, uh, let's leave chat GPT alone for the moment. Um, now, this is the interesting bit that, this is a bit that I find interesting. So Jesus said, uh, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. Verse 20, at once they left their nets and followed him. At once. You know, it's, it's like they just knew that they knew that this was the right thing to do. I wonder if you've had this experience. You just know that you know that it's right. I remember when uh, I was in my late teens and my mum had just come back to faith and I was at boarding school a long way away and, and she was praying for me and I was, you know, completely convinced that all of this God religious stuff was complete hogwash. I just, it was like, how could you be so stupid? You know, uh, I, I thought I was pretty smart at the time, too smart for that sort of thing. And... And God just took hold of my life. Like it was this, it, and it actually, the, the aroma idea, it was a little bit like that. It's, it's like I started to become sensible of this reality and I tried to push it away and I just, it just was, was so compelling. It was this faint, you know, it was a faint aroma. It wasn't a big experience. It was like a faint aroma that just stuck with me, that just persisted because God is a God who comes to us. And this is an interesting thing about this. In Jewish society at the time, people followed rabbis. I mean, uh, what they would do is that they would find themselves a rabbi and they would often live with the rabbi and copy them and, and fo literally follow them around. Actually, that's uh, how they did it. Now, one of the interesting things is that they always chose the rabbi. The rabbi never chose them. They always chose the rabbi. And so this is a marked difference because Jesus comes to them and he chooses them. And they just know that they know that they know that this is where they should go. Now, the reason why I find this interesting is because there are a lot of people who genuinely go looking for what shall we call it? The truth, answers, and that's great. And they read lots of books and they look into all religions and they do this sort of thing. And it just seems to be this endless circle that never quite ends up anywhere. And a and, and couple of reasons are that first of all, when we're the ones looking for the rabbi in this sense, we, we, we go looking for something that suits us, and let's admit, we don't want to change too much, you know. Uh, so we look, tend, we look for something that sort of suits us. But also we go looking for something that makes sense to us in the sense of, you know, adult, ex what, adult explicit knowledge. We look for something that makes sense to us. And the combination of those two things is that we thereby actually shut ourselves out from the truth of God, right? Because the thing about God is that he wants to kind of take over your life. I mean, who does he think he is? Like, Lord God, oh, he is God. And he wants to take charge, like for the better. But also, we're talking about something here that you can't just think your way into, you can't work this out. When you're talking about spiritual things, this is bigger than what can be, than what can be grasped in language. And so it goes back to what I said about this childlike knowledge, this willingness to be embraced by a God who is beyond what we can think or imagine. And this is what's happening here. Jesus comes to these guys. He chooses them. 
And they just know that they know that they know. And I know what this feels like. (laughs) I know that this feels like. Because when Jesus took hold of my life, when God came to me in Jesus Christ, I knew that I knew that I knew. Now, interestingly, I didn't really know until my conscience was awakened. And this weird thing happened to me, things that before had seemed fun to me, I had this very deep sense like I was desecrating something sacred. And and I was experiencing this inner turmoil called guilt. And I I knew that there was something wrong. I just didn't know what was wrong. And and I had heard enough. I I had met Christians and 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 I had heard enough about Jesus to know there's something about God coming to us in Jesus and, and paying for our sins. And, and I just remember being compelled to pray, Lord, lift this, forgive me. And I can still, and I, you know, I've talked about this, I can still remember the moment where that just completely lifted on, off me. And I knew that I knew that I knew. And ever since that moment, I have followed Jesus falteringly, I have strayed to the left and the right. I've fallen behind. I've also done plenty of running ahead. But he has remained faithful to me. And so I know what this feels like. And maybe you're here today just because maybe you're new to this and there's something that's happening in your life and it's difficult to explain and if people really probed you about it, you know, you you wouldn't be able to explain it or prove it but you know that you know that you know because something's being reawakened within you. Uh, It goes on, there's more, which I'll, uh, I'll read a little bit more of this. Going from there, he saw two brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and see this again, and immediately they left the, left the boat and their father and followed him. Immediately, because they knew that they knew that they knew. And then Matthew, the writer of the gospel, tells the story of when Jesus came to him. And the interesting thing about this is Matthew knows that he was probably the last one that anyone would have expected to be a follower of Jesus because he was a very corrupt official that robbed people. They call them tax collectors in this time. He was a bad guy, very wealthy. You know, he was uh, not good. And and generally seen as a kind of quintessential bad guy. And yet this is what it says. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Now, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees, these Uh, religious leaders uh, saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, is not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come not to call the righteous, but the sinners. There's something uh, about knowing, knowing that you know that you know. There's something about our recognizing our need, the reality of our deep spiritual need, it's part of what uncovers this ability to know, right? Because we're so self-subsistent and we're so self-righteous and entitled and, and you have to strip that away, right? And when we recognize how much we need forgiveness and how broken we, there's something about that that's kind of breaks us open, like it breaks our hearts open and it enables us to be porous again, right? It's like the walls get broken down. And then one more, uh, one more section here. So Jesus 
continues with his ministry. And then at one point, he, it, it says this in Matthew chapter 9. I'm going to go forward to Matthew chapter 9. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. The good news is that God is calling everyone back to himself. This is the good news of the kingdom. God is calling all of his kids to come back home. And Jesus went out, whoever you are, you come back to God. And he's going to establish his, his, his good rule, his good and loving rule in your life. That's what, meant, that's what is meant by the kingdom of God. When he saw the crowds, it says, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, I just want to focus on this bit for a second. The issue here for Jesus is not that the harvest is not plentiful. There were lots of people ready. There were lots of people ready to receive this message. That wasn't the issue. The issue was that he was looking for people who dared to step out and shine a light. People to step out and be that aroma in the midst of the world so that this could be reawakened in people, so that people would know that they know that they know. And you know, I, I, I lately, I've been a Christian for a, a long time. I can't even remember how many years, 35. I feel like I've been saying that for a, a, a few years. How long? Anyway, it doesn't matter. I, and so I've been involved in church a long, long time. Do you know, in all of my years of being a Christian, being involved in church, I have never experienced a time when I have witnessed so many people coming and exploring faith for the first time as I have witnessed in the last probably year, year and a half. You know, at the start of the year, um, Phil Lowe was, was preaching and, and, and Phil uh, just spoke to something that he felt like God put on his heart and, and, and he directed it to me and he said, I, he said to me, he said, Matt, I believe that this year that you are going to see something that your heart has longed for. And you know, I had that experience, I'm thinking, I went away, I'm thinking, I wonder what that is. <laughs> you know, you know when, you, when you deeply long for something, but it seems so impossible uh, or maybe you get tired of waiting to see it and so you just forget that you ever asked for that in the first place. Remember a, a few years ago I, I met with a, um, a group of people, someone new came to church and they brought along some other people and they said, can you... Uh, I've got some friends, you know they're, they're, you know, they're completely new to faith and church and they've got all these questions. Can you come and, you know, sit in the room and have a chat with them? And I thought, oh, absolutely, right, great, you know. And I sat in that room and talking about, you know, talking to these people. I remember walking away from that thinking, I think this is what it's all about. And the moment I tasted that, it reminded me, ah, oh, this is what we exist for, actually. This is what church is for. Like, and, and I, for a number of months after that, I was my main prayer, I was praying, Lord, I want to see, I want to see people come into faith in and through your church. Because I just felt like at the time we were really in-house. We're like a church, you know, we're like a, a ship kind of gliding through the, uh, and we're just doing our own thing and, and you know, kind of the, the Christian club. And that experience made me very, very dissatisfied with that. And at the time, actually, we were going pretty well at church. There's plenty of people coming and everything was fine in one sense. But that reminded me something about the heart of God. You see, that's not enough. Because the heart of God 
The heart of God is for his lost kids. And I prayed for that for a while and then I, to be honest, I gave up. And I went out to different areas and found opportunities to connect with, I mean, I, that, that became a regular habit of mine. I just always wanted to put myself in situations where I'm, you know, because, you know, as a pastor and as a lecturer in a theological college, you know, I can live in Christian land. And look, don't get me wrong, I love Christians. They're, 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 I mean, they're all right, a bit annoying sometimes, but they're all right. <laughs> you know, but, but I wanna, I wanna talk to people about Jesus. Like, I've experienced the, the truth of God, and there's something about letting that light shine that, that I just love. And so since that time, I put myself in, in, in that circumstance as much as I can. And I've said this before, you know, and there was part of me that sort of, sort of envied the fact that most of you get to live in that circumstance all the time. Like, you know, you're in amongst all different people of all different walks of life. And here I'm, you know, I'm back at home base, you know, in base camp, you know, and, and, and you know, with you guys. And, and again, you're great. I, I really, don't, don't, don't get me wrong here. Love you guys. You're all good. Um, well, that's an exag- let's not exaggerate, but, um, but, you know, and I, I just thought, oh, gee, what, what an amazing opportunity you all have. And one of the reasons why I think we don't take or we don't own or recognize that opportunity is that it seems so hard to us. I think we have this sense, like there's some, oh man, I've got to convince people, and and oh, what am I going to say? And I don't know enough, you know, you know, I I I don't have, I don't have the qualifications, or and and so we get scared about it when actually all we need to do is just be a little bit open, because no one ever came to faith just through clever arguments. No one ever came to faith because of the articulacy or intelligence of the person speaking to them. It was because of that intangible something. It's because of the aroma of Christ in each one of us. It's even if it's faint, for goodness sake, even if it's faint, if we will just let it out. Like, can we just let it out? Because what we are experiencing is the fact that the harvest is plentiful. I feel like God is throwing rocks at our window, you know, saying, hey, get out of bed, come turn the lights of the house on. I want the lights turned on because I'm bringing my kids home. Because I'm bringing my kids home. Will you turn on a light for goodness sake? And as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. It's not like there's any great thing that you need to do or be convincing. No, you just need to be open. Just let it out just a little bit. Try a little bit and you will experience the joy of God. Because there is rejoicing in heaven. when one of God's little kids, and every person is one of God's little kids, when every one of his little kids realizes, oh, I'm not an orphan. I have a home. And I tell you what, we have not known rejoicing We have not known rejoicing. We've known some joy, but I tell you, there is more to come. There is so much more to come because this party is for the prodigals. This party is for the lost. We're putting on a party. We're throwing that net thing over the side. (laughs) We're going to make this ship accessible. And we're not going to sacrifice, you know, we're going to go deep. We're going to, this is, you know what we are as a church? We're a whole bunch of really broken people seeking God together. And this journey, it's not just for us. 
Talk about it. Invite people on the journey. Let a little bit of that aroma out. Let out a little bit of that light. I believe God is talking to us. I'd like to say that all of these people that are exploring faith and coming to church for this, I'd like to say it was something that we're doing. I mean, the interesting thing is, in most cases, it's nothing that any of us did. I'm sure you're doing lots of great stuff. I know it's, if, if you are here today and you're new, it's gonna sound like I'm being a bit mean to the Christians. Let me actually just tell you a little secret. They love it damn deep down, no really. Let's turn on the lights. Let's set the table. We're going to prepare a party because the kids are coming home. All right? I want you to stand with me together and we are going to celebrate Jesus in the way that he asks us to do. And we're going to dedicate ourselves to Jesus, not just to Jesus, but to the mission of Jesus. Because what it means to follow Jesus, it means to do the things that Jesus is passionate about doing. And we're going to recommit ourselves to this. And maybe if you're here today for the first time and just exploring faith, and as I've said, there are many, uh, many people uh, like that in our midst, and we absolutely welcome you. I have total confidence in what is happening in your life. It's why we don't ever have to, we, you know, we don't have to push you, or because I just believe in what God is doing in your life. We're just here to journey with you, right? We're all on that journey. We're here to journey with you. And one of the ways uh, in which we respond, because we do need to respond to God. When God takes hold of your life, you need to respond to God. We need to say yes to Jesus. And the best way to do that, we have a, a very tangible way of doing that. And we take these symbols that Jesus gave us that symbolize the price that he paid to purchase us from guilt. He, the, the, this little bit of bread that represents his broken body and a little cup that represents his shed blood. And as we eat and drink, we're saying yes to Jesus. And if today you are ready to say yes to Jesus, then why don't you take... Uh, a bit of the bread and a bit of the cup. I want you to hold on to it. You guys can hand that out now, thanks. Please, if you're not ready to do this today, let it pass you by. There's absolutely no pressure. You might need to, you know, just consider this or whatever. No pressure, let it pass you by if you're not ready. But if today you wanna respond to the God who has taken hold of your life, then say yes to Him by taking these symbols. Father, we thank you that you come to us when we get lost, when we get cut off, when we lose our way, Lord. You come to us and we thank you, Lord, for your endless love, Lord God, that never runs out, your endless grace, your endless series of second chances. You never give up on us. You continue to pursue us. And you call us home. You call us to live with you. And I believe today, Lord, you're calling us to turn the lights on. Put over the net, the scramble net. That's what, sorry, scramble net. That's what it's called. It's called I, so people can scramble aboard. Today, Lord, we say yes. Okay. Okay. You're calling us to be lights, Lord. Oh, oh yes, Lord. Okay, then. We'll let out a little bit of love. We're a bit scared, <laughs> aren't we? We're a bit scared. But love overcomes fear. But love is going to overcome fear. realize we've been duped. It's not that hard. It's got to let out a bit of light and see what God does. And we say yes to that today. You're calling us to be the aroma of Christ. Okay. All right, Lord. Help us, Father, to be the people 
that you want us to be. Because the harvest is plentiful. Because your children are out there. Because you are calling them home. You are working in their hearts even now, Lord. Yes, we dedicate our lives to you. And if today for the first time, Lord Jesus, we pray, take hold of my life, fill me with your spirit. Today I give my life to you. And as we eat and we drink together, we say one big yes to Jesus. Let's do that.